Well, good morning, guys, and thank you so much for having me back for the second week in a row to pick up where we left off. Last week we finished Romans chapter 7 and this week I am so excited to bring you the teaching on Romans chapter 8. And before we get started, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Megan Fondren and remember I'm the layman or the, the laywoman when it comes to spiritual matters. You know, I am just like you when it comes to everything that I've learned about Jesus and, and God's word has been through the Holy Spirit and what he's taught me. And so I just like to put that disclosure statement out there every time I am invited and have the honor and the privilege to bring the Sunday morning message to encourage you that God can call you to great and mighty things. And, and it might be scary and awkward, but that is totally awesome because he is going to equip you for it and get you through it. So I just want to encourage you all this morning to wake up to what your purpose in life is because God wants to bring you alive and use you, bring you blessing and bring so many Many people to know him through what he wants to do in your life. So let's get right started in Romans chapter 8. But first and always, let's pray and approach God's throne of grace with confidence this morning, knowing that he hears us and he loves us. So let's pray. God, we just thank you once again for another opportunity that we have to join together as a family of believers with one purpose in mind, which is to bring glory to you. And this morning we're coming to do that by, by hungering for more of you. So I just pray that you show up and do what only you can, God. Change those hearts of stone into hearts of flesh so that we can receive and we can hear you um, for who you are, see you for who you are, God. Just change us from the inside out. Have your way with us. We give you permission mission, Holy Spirit. We love you. We praise you. All the honor and glory to your name forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been in the book of Romans for the last several weeks, and I think that most of you probably can agree with me that just when you think you have a little handle on who God is and how amazing he is, you find there's another layer and you go a little deeper and your mind is blown all over again. That's how I've been feeling these last several weeks as we've been taking time to study the book of Romans. So just a quick recap. Um, do you remember Saul, our Christian killer, right? His story can be found in the book of Acts. Well, if you remember, Saul was this self-righteous zealot of a Jew who was so dedicated to what he thought he knew based on some stinking thinking that he had about the law, right? So in the name of God, he was going around killing Christians or anybody who opposed the way that he thought about this law, right? But that was until Jesus got a hold of him. After a single encounter with our resurrected Savior, his life was changed forever. He got a new identity, a new name. So Saul becomes Paul, and he has this new mission in life, which is to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And that is so, so totally awesome to me because Saul was not equipped at the time. But because of what Jesus did for him and the transformation that came about because of that encounter, he is now equipped. And the whole book of Romans is one of the many letters that Paul wrote. And I love the book of Romans because it kind of just sums up this gospel message. And so chapters one and two, they kind of describe the human condition of our sin and the law that God established to atone for that sin, if you remember. And in these chapters, it seems that for us, the, the hope is lost because we find that we, Jews, Gentiles, all of us, have been tried for our sin and we've been found guilty. The perfect and good God, he has established what is required of us to be righteous in his eyes, but we're simply unrighteous and therefore we can't be reconciled to him in and of ourselves. So he gave us this law as the standard of that righteousness and we just fail to meet that standard, which we find in these chapters that means that we're sinners and that we are stuck in our sin because remember, sin isn't doing bad things or being a bad person necessarily. It simply means falling short of the standard of righteousness that God has set which again seems dire to us because we find in these chapters that the cost of that sin is death. So just when all hope seems lost, chapters 3 and 5 come along and we see how God never sent this law to show us how to become righteous in our own efforts because that would be self-righteousness. He sent the law to show us that we can't be righteous in ourselves. We need a savior. And thank God he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life as we learn from chapter or Romans 3. 
So because of this God and his, his redeeming story, that plan that he had from the beginning of time, all we have to do instead of meet that standard of righteousness that we can't meet, we just have to have faith in the one who did meet it, which is Jesus Christ. And then we get eternal life with him. And then chapter six and seven, we learned how to find freedom from the bondage and the burden of that perfect law. And we left off in chapter seven last week, kind of in a desperate situation. We left off describing the frustration of our own efforts and our trying and our striving to be good, yet we keep failing and failing because we're doing it wrong. We get so caught up in our attempt to stop sinning in ourselves that it actually becomes a burden to us to try to be good. And that causes us to get stuck in this vicious cycle of, of conviction and sin and guilt, and we can't stop it in and of ourselves. And I love how Paul nails it on the head in chapter 7, verse 24, where he says, what a wretched man I am. I think we all can relate to that when it comes to us trying to stop sinning in and of ourselves. But Thank you, Jesus, that Paul didn't stop there. The latter part of Romans 7, 24 says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And in verse 25, he answers his own question when he says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so this now brings us to the hope of Romans chapter eight. So I hope you're ready. Let's dive right in because the, the, the meat of this chapter is found in the very first verse. Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Guys, get excited because that cycle of conviction, of sin, of guilt, it is broken now because of what Jesus did. Chapter 8 is all about how we do this through living a life in the Holy Spirit. And Galatians 5.16 puts it this way, and I think it's very simple. Galatians 5.16, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. It seems as simple as that. When we walk in the Spirit, we are guaranteed holy living. And when we're walking in the Spirit, we are not going to sin. This is just a holy promise, you know? And it, that's why it's so important for us to understand what it means to walk in the Holy Spirit and how we live a life walking in the Holy Spirit. Because the power to live the life free of sin and free of that burden of law and to live the life abundant that Jesus bled and died for, it doesn't come in our own efforts, but in living a Holy Spirit lifestyle. So chapter eight is all about our declaration of our freedom from sin because everything that was required of us has been satisfied by Jesus's sacrifice and his death. And because we are crucified with him and we are resurrected with him into new life, that satisfies God's requirement of us for righteous. And now we are perfect in God's eyes and we are now reconciled to him. So this is so exciting, so exciting. And I want to go through chapter eight of Romans by answering a few questions about the Holy Spirit, starting with question number one, who is the Holy Spirit? John 14, 16, which was written in Greek, by the way, says that the Holy Spirit is the paraclete. That's a Greek word and translated into our modern English would be, uh, he's the comforter, the counselor, the advocate, the encourager. He's basically somebody who comes alongside us and does life with us, helping us, guiding us, leading us, being there for whatever need that we have. Uh, the Bible also tells us in John 14, 17, that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And then uh, Hebrews 13, 5, Matthew 28, 20, John 16, 5 through 7, describe how the Holy Spirit is actually God's spirit and therefore his presence as well. So we could truly spend an entire month on a sermon series talking about the Holy Spirit, and we could spend a whole entire week talking about who he is. But for the sake of time and, and the, the rest of chapter eight that I want to get through, I'm going to move on to question number two, which what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? John 14, 26 says one of his purposes is to teach you all things and remind us of what Jesus has said. 
So this is especially good for those of us who, as we get a little bit older, we might not have the best um, memorization skills anymore. I remember I used to be able to write down one word on a note card and have a plethora of information on the back of that note card pertaining to something I had to study for, whether it was high school or college. And that one word would trigger all of those, those, those topics that were on the other side. And I could spout it off like no other. That is not so easy for me anymore. So that's the same for me now when it comes to memorizing scripture. I find that it's difficult when I try to do it in my own strength. But I love one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit. When you look at God's word and you read God's word and ask the Holy Spirit, invite him in as you're reading, something happens on that spirit realm. And so it, it gets more into your essence of who you are as a person. And so therefore it's easier to memorize it because it gets embedded and ingrained in who you are. And that's the Holy Spirit at work. And I always think of testimonies like Melissa Tylus and so many others who have shared that they were in like their darkest moments of their lives and they were about to turn to something and give up hope, but yet they heard this still small voice say something to them. And then days, weeks, months, maybe even years later, they find out that it was actually something from scripture that they heard in that dark time. Guys, that is the Holy Spirit. And that is him fulfilling one of his purposes to teach us and to remind us of what Jesus has said. And other ways that we can do this is through good Christian mentors in our lives, having good pastors that we listen to, coming to church on Sunday mornings and listening, or joining in on a podcast or a, a YouTube channel or something like that where we can hear the truth. You know, getting together in life groups and talking about God's Word, getting together and doing Bible studies, or simply getting into God's Word in your quiet time and just asking the Holy Spirit to lead you and direct you. These are all ways that He can fulfill His purpose when you invite Him into that. John 14, 16-16. 26 tells us the Holy Spirit is also sent so that he may abide with us forever and dwell with us and be with us forever, thus fulfilling God's promise that he never leaves us, he never forsakes us. Uh, John 15, 26 tells us that the Holy Spirit is also there to testify of Jesus. Uh, John 16, 13 through 14, he is there to guide us into all truth, to tell us what is yet to come, to glorify Jesus, and to make known what Jesus wants us to know. And then 1 Corinthians 12, 17 through 14, the Holy Spirit within us is there to profit all. And he does this by giving us gifts from the Holy Spirit to each person individually as God determines. So when we get saved, the Holy Spirit, according to God, he uh, gives out certain spiritual gifts based on what God desires from us. And these spiritual gifts include wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kind of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. And again, these can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 14. So all of these different gifts are given out to each individual believer according to God's desire. We each get the gifts, but to each gets a certain amount more. You know, like I think of Mary Stiverson, she definitely has the gift of prophecy. I think of Carrie Craig, she has the gift of discernment, discerning of spirits, those kinds of things. Things. We all are capable of doing those things, but each of us has more of a gift or so uh, based on the Holy Spirit. But all of these gifts come from the same Spirit, and, and each of these gifts are given to the individuals because we are meant to work together as one body with one purpose, just as our physical bodies work together with one as one for one purpose. As a spiritual body, activating these gifts is so important because then we can bring glory to our Father in Heaven together as a family. And this wouldn't be doable without the Holy Spirit. And then moving on, Acts 1.8 describes another purpose of the Holy Spirit is to give us power and to create us to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Because when our names get written in the Lamb's Book of Life, something inside of us awakens and we get so excited and we become empowered to go out and share this good news with others so that their names can be written in the Lamb's Book of Life in that permanent blood, right? So, Again, all of this stuff, we just talked about who the Holy Spirit is and a few of his purposes. And the purposes probably could be a whole two-week sermon message. But again, for the sake of time, I want to move on because it's one thing to know who the Holy Spirit is and what his purpose is. But if we don't know how to apply it, it's kind of moot anyway. So question number three is how do we live a Holy Spirit lifestyle?
And to answer this question, I actually turned to one of my favorite books. It's called 10 Steps to Christ, and it's by Jimmy Evans. He is a pastor, a speaker, an author. He's amazing. And in this book, he actually provides one chapter full of this lifestyle in the Holy Spirit. And that entire chapter is, is provides a ton of scripture backing up how this is done. And it's done in such a simple layman's terms, something easily understandable. So I encourage you to check it out. Out, no matter your spiritual walk, 10 Steps to Christ is just chock full of so much information. And one chapter pertains to living a Holy Spirit lifestyle. And that's where I got um, a lot of information on this. So first and foremost, uh, we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and this is being baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is kind of a separate issue from being saved or being baptized with water. And just to, to go into what I mean here, being saved is a salvation issue and it requires a savior to redeem us from our sin. So that was what we did when we made that inward declaration that we are choosing Jesus as our Lord and savior. We recognize our sin, we're repenting of our sin and we receive by faith Jesus as our Lord and savior. That's what salvation and getting saved entails. And then after that, we get baptized by water because that is an outward declaration of that inward decision that we made. And here at this church at Real Life, we believe in a full water immersion where we go completely under the water because we believe that that represents and an, um, symbolizes our death and our sin and our flesh dying and being nailed to the cross and buried in that grave with Jesus and then raising again in new life completely clean with Jesus and his resurrection power. And so full immersion into water here is our declaration to make known that we are showing our devotion and our obedience to Jesus' command when he says repent and be baptized as Acts 2.38 says. So that's being saved and then being baptized in water. So then Jimmy Evans says in this book, being baptized in the Holy Spirit is about the Holy Spirit and allowing him to immerse us in his fullness and empower us to serve God. And this is so important for Christians because if you're trying to do this Christian life and walk this Christian walk without being baptized in the Holy Spirit, it is so much more difficult and you're kind of stuck in where we were in that desperate spot last week as we talked about in Romans chapter 7 in the striving and the trying and getting tired out and doing it in your own strength. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit is a whole new ball game for believers and it's my prayer and my belief that God is going to do something in you today and awaken that within you. So to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, we simply ask him to come and baptize us. And then we receive him by faith, just like we did when we received Christ as our Lord and Savior. Because the Holy Spirit is a free gift from God. It's his presence and his power with us always. And the Bible is very clear that God is our good, good father, and he loves to give us good gifts. So when you ask to receive the Holy Spirit, you do so in faith and then you receive him even if you don't feel like it because you probably didn't feel any different when you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior yet your entire identity changed and your entire eternity changed that is huge so it's okay if you don't feel anything specific when you ask the Holy Spirit to come and baptize you and you know it, it doesn't have to be when you ask the Holy Spirit to come and lead you and guide you and immerse you into his fullness. It doesn't have to be anything, any big spectacle, any magic sentences, any magic phrases. You can do it right now in the comfort of your own home, wherever you are while you're driving, whatever you're doing right this moment, you can just say, Holy Spirit, come and baptize me. I invite you into my life. Lead me, direct me, guide me. And then when you say that, receive him by faith and that you're now baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this might be something that you have to do multiple times every day. And definitely at least once a day, you're gonna to have to do it. At first, you're probably not gonna feel different like we just talked about, but eventually things are going to change. And then once you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we then have him taking the lead in our lives, which can be the most difficult part because us as human beings, we love to be in control and we love to lead, right? Our, especially when it comes to our own lives. But the best part about letting the Holy Spirit take the lead is that we get 
get to let go of the control and then we just get to sit back and relax and rest and have that peace that we desire so much. So it might be hard, but once you actually let go of the control and let the Holy Spirit lead and direct you, he is going to come and fill you, teach you, guide you, comfort you, come alongside you as your advocate and thus fulfill his purposes that we talked about minutes ago. So then once you allow this to happen, this opens the door to allow him to come in and change you and change your mind. Romans 8, 5 through 6, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. So that's back in Romans chapter 7, that frustration, right? But those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. And the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. And remember that word peace in Hebrew, which is the Bible's original language, that is shalom, which means nothing missing, nothing broken, contentment, wholeness, health, provision, prosperity. It's so much more than just chilling out and having no chaos going on around you. No, it is having those things even in the chaos, which is amazing. And notice here from this passage that we're not talking about our will because our will fails. We can't choose to do good. God makes the the necessary changes that he requires of humanity, not our will leading us to change our ways. It is not an act of willpower. It It is an act of faith. And then the good will come out of living this Holy Spirit lifestyle. So the good is the the good that we inevitably start to do is not by our own efforts and us trying. It's this natural byproduct of living this Holy Spirit lifestyle, which is so awesome. So point number four, we now know who the Holy Spirit is. We have a little bit of understanding of what his purpose is. And I encourage you to dig deeper because like I said, we could spend hours talking about who he is and what his purpose is. So dig deep into God's word and find out more for yourself. But now we know how to get him in us and allow him to take the lead. So question number four is what are the results of living this Holy Spirit lifestyle? So when we have the Holy Spirit in us and we're baptized in him, we now can be changed and understand the hope of Romans chapter eight. So the very powers that brought the shame and the frustration that we discussed last week in Romans chapter 7, they're now destroyed through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That is exciting. And the expectation of holy living that we talked about a couple weeks ago in chapter 6, that is met and finds fulfillment through the Holy Spirit's work, not our work. So Romans 8, 11 says the same power that gave life to the dead body of Jesus now resides in you, resides in me as a believer. Guys, this is good news. You don't have to strive. Because of the Holy Spirit's work, we are now transformed by the renewing of our minds. And we can find that verse, Romans 12, 12. And so this transformation, this is a process because remember transformation is is typically, it takes time. You know, I think of of a transformation of a caterpillar to a butterfly and my sister-in-law, my brother's wife, she has this little obsession or maybe it's just a passion, but for me who has no passion for butterflies that much, it comes off a little bit obsession because she um, has this passion for monarchs and her home, her garden outside her home is legitimately like a labeled monarch like rest stop or something like that because she has the right flowers and plants in her garden um, for monarchs to come around. She doesn't use chemicals in her garden, that kind of thing. But she takes it a step further because she actually raises monarch butterflies and then sets them free. So one time, uh, my brother and her were going on a vacation and they asked us to babysit these monarchs. And you would think by now I would remember and understand the lifestyle or the life cycle of a monarch butterfly, but I still don't. But I remember that they started out on these little individual plastic cups with like a piece of pantyhose, um, like rubber band around it. And that had the little leaf with a tiny little egg on it. And when the little larva came out and had a little food, we had to transfer it into this little cage 
cage and then we would watch them grow into these big old fat caterpillars and feed them just the right amount and then eventually they would build these chrysalises and all of a sudden these chrysalis would just start to vibrate and open up and then these butterflies would emerge and they were beautiful but Sam made sure that I did not set them free right away they had to stay in their cage for about 12 to 24 hours to make sure they had the strength to fly away and then the most amazing thing when the kids and I took this probably dozen butterflies this this cage full of a dozen butterflies out and we opened it up and just they flew away fulfilling their purpose in their beautiful transformed state that's what I think about when I think about us being transformed by the renewing of our mind, it's this, we're constant, it's this process that is constantly changing us so that our behavior catches up to our new identity. And over time, just like that butterfly, and for each of us it's different. Some, yes, it's an instantaneous transformation in some areas, but for most of us it's more of like a slow and steady kind of thing. But over time, our, even our personalities start to change to reflect the personality of Jesus. And some of his personality traits can be found in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to change our personalities into something like this that matches Jesus, these fruits will then spill over into our everyday lives. We become better spouses, children, parents, friends, co-workers, employees, you know, all those things. And it's the Holy Spirit that gives us power that will break the death-dealing force of sin and unworthy habits. And I love how Galatians 5.24 says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their past passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and are crucified there with them. The old way of the world, you know, when the old way of the world that began at the fall, let's say that when sin entered the world and, and, and the world completely changed at that time that led to sin and, and our flesh bringing condemnation that started at the fall in the garden, you know, that has come to wreak havoc upon all humanity because now this sin is unleashed in this ripple effect and it's been detrimental but that has now been destroyed because Jesus brought condemnation to that very sin and flesh that brought that condemnation in the first place. Jesus has now destroyed it. He banished both that sin, that flesh, that burden of the law. He did it for the sake of his believers. So we don't stop sinning in order to come to Jesus. It's just we come to Jesus first and then that sin just doesn't matter anymore because of the life that we receive through the Holy Spirit lifestyle is just so much better and now we are empowered through the Holy Spirit to have victory over our sin not because we have to stop trying to sin this is amazing because we're powerless in our own self efforts and this whole not sinning thing doesn't come from us anyway it comes from understanding the Holy Spirit lifestyle and then finally living that free and full abundant life that Jesus intended for us to have and this automatically leads to a desire to live for Jesus which automatically leads to this personality shift like we just mentioned a few minutes ago and sin just naturally dissolves away in our lives because we're so focused on the joy that it comes with serving Jesus and you know it breaks my heart when I hear about people like testimonies or whatever not testimonies I should say but stories about people who don't want to come to church who don't want to come to know Jesus because they don't want to be made to feel guilty and they don't want to stop sinning you know those stories break my heart because that means that we as Christ ambassadors, we've gotten something wrong here in our communication with the world because our message to them should not be one of guilt or condemnation or, or self-righteousness or deeds done right in order to get to heaven. Our story should match the truth of why Jesus came, which is to seek and save the lost. That because of his great love for us, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. 
That's what the story is. So our story to the world out there should be of a love so powerful that you don't have to change in order to receive it. You come to know this great love and then because of what that love does on the inside, you're transformed and that sin just doesn't matter to you anymore. The Holy Spirit gets a hold of you and does a work. That is the story that we need to be saying. So let's get our story straight, guys, because the world out there needs to hear the truth and we have the privilege and we have the opportunity and we have the call to go and take this good news and share it with them. That's the truth of the gospel. So a little tangent there, but where were we? Uh, let's see here. Um, living a life through the Holy Spirit. So Romans 8.15 tells us that we are no longer slaves, but we are adopted into sonship. And it goes on to say that we cry, Abba, Father. And this is huge because verse 16 tells us that the same or the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We're his kids. And crying Abba, Father is precious because in our language, it's translated into daddy, not just father. And honestly, I don't know anybody who understands this concept more than Miss Mary McGee. If you guys don't know Mary, you need to get to know her. She understands that our father is daddy. And when a kid calls their dad father, you know, I think of like this cold, distant relationship. But when a kid calls their dad daddy, man, I think of warmth and intimacy and unconditional love. I think about a strong hand reaching out with compassion. I think of my own daddy that I called daddy until I was an adult. Um, when I crashed my bike outside his house and he heard me crying and he comes running out and he scoops me up in his big, strong arms and he takes me in the house and he bandages my boo-boos. That's what I think of when I hear a kid call their dad daddy I think of my husband holding one of my kids hands in the parking lot even if they're squirming trying to get away from him because they think that they know how to walk across the parking lot safely but my husband holds on tight with his firm love because he knows better and he knows that he's protecting those kids that's what I hear when I hear a kid call their father daddy and that's how God wants us to see him Despite what kind of earthly father you had, whether it was good or bad, God is the greatest father and the best relationship that you are ever going to have and that you're ever going to experience. And so not only does being adopted as God's children mean that we get this awesome daddy, it also means that we get to share in Christ's inheritance, which is awesome. Romans 8, 17, since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs to God's glory. So with being a son or a daughter or an heir, this not only comes with receiving the inheritance, but it also comes with the ability to speak and the authority of our Father and on our behalf. So that's pretty awesome too. And our Father just so happens to be the creator of the universe, and all things are from Him, through Him, and to Him, as Romans 11.36 tells us. That's our dad. So that's pretty awesome there. But verse 17 does also tell us that there is a double inheritance here as children of God. So first we share in his glory, and this means that we get to partake in the blessings that come along to those who obey him. And some of these blessings, this is amazing, can be found in, in Deuteronomy 28. I want to read it for you. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow his commandments, I give you today the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All blessings will come on you you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city, blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. The crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds, the lambs of your flocks, your baskets and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in. You will be blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will rise up, but they will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but they will flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on every everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that he is giving you. He will establish you as his holy people. Guys, this is the blessing that comes to the one who obeys his commands. And we can't do it in and of ourselves, but remember, Jesus could and he did, and we are now crucified with him, but also resurrected to new life with him, and we are now heirs to these blessings as well. Get excited about that. That was Deuteronomy chapter 28, because it's these blessings that we get to cling to when the second part of this inheritance comes into play here, because the latter part of Romans 8 17 points out that but if we are to share in his glory 
we must also share in his suffering. And I want to change gears here just for a minute because I love how Paul is so real. He doesn't just sugarcoat things. He tells it as it is because it's so fun. One of my favorite parts of having the opportunity to do what I do on Sunday mornings and then to come and preach a gospel message is because I get to give you encouragement and speak hope and life to you. And that is so fun. But but there is a part of our Christian walk that is a little bit sobering and it's a little bit hard to swallow, you know, because there's real suffering that we have to face and, and a life and a walk with Jesus is not always going to be smiles and sunshine and, and roses and laughs and all these things. There's real suffering. In fact, Jesus himself said in, in John 16, 33, he said, in this world, you will have trouble, but to take heart because he has overcome this world. And remember, life in the Holy Spirit, that's why we talked about this first, because this leads us, directs us, he guides us, he comforts us so that we can face this suffering. And to get a little bit more information on what the suffering Paul was talking about, I actually turned, Pastor Tim gave me the, his commentary on the book of Romans to look this up. And in this commentary for the book of Romans, suffering is defined as agony, affliction, distress, intense pain, or sorrow. And it goes on to explain that suffering has been a part of our human existence since the fall from Genesis. And even Psalms paints this huge graphic picture of suffering. One third of all the Psalms, most of them are written by David, one third of them are actually laments about David's suffering himself. And then Psalm 22 is actually a prophecy about Jesus's future suffering. So the Bible makes it clear that some suffering is the result of evil impact in the world when sin entered back in Genesis, and some suffering is related to persecution or hardships, but despite where that suffering originates from, the right response of a believer to that suffering can actually refine the character of that believer, and that's 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 and chapter 5, verse 10. And the book of Hebrews declares that Jesus himself learned obedience by the things that he had to suffer and that his suffering was the key to perfecting his full provision for our need and our need is which means that we need to rely on God and his fulfillment instead of turning to this frustration of this empty world and what it has to offer, which is void of nothingness. So guys, suffering is part of our inheritance. But with Jesus, there is always good news, no matter what we're facing, because Romans 8.18 reminds us that the suffering in our present life, it is nothing to compare to the glory that we are going to experience in the life to come. And the amazing thing is that, yes, we share in Christ's suffering, but we don't have to go through it alone. We have the Holy Spirit to guide us, lead us, direct us, teach us, comfort us, counsel us, be our advocate, and remember, also empower us. And that also fulfills his purpose, if you remember. And just because we're living in God's grace doesn't mean that we are exempt from the hardships of that came into existence when Adam brought sin into the world, when Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. We are not exempt from it because we're still living in this fallen world. But Christ's suffering, which again, we are heirs to, this can be a promise of available release from our suffering. But it doesn't just mean an available release. It also means there's a promise of grace to go through the suffering. But it doesn't just mean a promise of grace. It also means triumph through the suffering as well because we are in Christ Jesus and we have the Holy Spirit who makes us more than conquerors. And remember, God never lets suffering go to waste. It produces hope, and this hope is not dependent on our circumstance. It's not dependent on something that we can see in the physical. It's dependent on something that we trust and we know and we have faith will come to pass. Because you don't hope for something that you already have, right? Romans 8 goes on to tell us that even creation, the earth itself, is groaning along with us because there was this frustration that occurred at the curse or the fall when sin entered the world. And not just for humanity, but for creation itself. God's intentional design for this perfect paradise and this perfect humanity, it had to be rewired because sin messed it up. 
So God rewired it and he rewired things so that we would constantly have this hunger for him. Not just us as humans, but creation itself would just long for him and hunger for him. And he did this in hope that creation itself would be liberated and this life, in this life, creation and humanity would never have satisfaction without him. So that we would give up our trying and our striving in ourselves and we would let go and let him come back to him, be reconciled with him and realize that we can find freedom and glory and peace in a life as God children. So this seems dire. It seems kind of awful that we have to face this suffering, but it's not because when we have the Holy Spirit within us, he guides us into this hope. And then Romans 8, 26 tells us that during our time of weakness, during our time of struggling, we have help through the Holy Spirit. And we are led by the Holy Spirit even to pray when we don't know what ourselves need to say. Without the Holy Spirit, this wouldn't be possible. Without the Holy Spirit, I don't know how anybody can face this world and the crazy chaos that abounds and the suffering that this world has. This is why it is so vital to understand who he is, his purpose, purpose and how to live a Holy Spirit lifestyle because we groan with this fallen world because the agony of that fallen world, it brushes up against us. Even though we are redeemed and saved by grace, we still live in this sin fallen world. And so we will, and we have experienced relational, emotional, even physical brokenness because of this fall. Our marriages may struggle. Our confidence as parents might waver. Our bodies might not always feel good. There may be times where even though we're walking in the Holy Spirit lifestyle, if we take our eyes off of him for a moment because we're human, we might still struggle and wrestle with fear, anxiety, depression, even sin sometimes. But this is what it means to groan alongside this fallen creation as Romans describes. But for us as believers with the Holy Spirit inside us, there is hope. And this hope will lead us to look forward to the day when we get the full adoption and we get to go to heaven on the other side of eternity where we can get our glorified bodies and we can cast off this flesh and these, these bodies that are decaying once and for all. But there's more hope too because a lifestyle in the Holy Spirit by nature fulfills God's desires. A lifestyle focused on the Holy Spirit leads us to the path of righteousness as Psalms 23, three says. A life focused on the Holy Spirit turns all things around for good for those who love Jesus. That's Romans 8, 28. Notice here that this passage doesn't say that God makes all things good and it definitely doesn't say that God even makes all things or that all things that happen to Christians Christians are good, but Romans 8.28 does tell us that God works in all things and he transitions them and molds them into our good. Sometimes that's even in our suffering. In Romans 8.27, the Holy Spirit knows what God's good and perfect will is. And if the Holy Spirit is in us, directing us, then God's will is going to come out of us, even if it is in our suffering. And this is why it is so important to keep our eyes on what Jesus did and not our sin, not our own striving, not our own self-righteousness. Because when we see ourselves clearly in the way that God sees us, which is as his children, righteous and perfect in his eyes, we are going to start living that way. Because think about labels, and it starts in grade school, right? It starts in kindergarten when the kids get labeled the naughty kids, the good kids. And I know nowadays they have all these you know, positivity projects and all these things to try to prevent labels from getting placed on children. But if we're honest, it still happens, okay? There's still that kid that eats in the principal's office every single week, and there's still that kid that gets extra brownie points because they help the teacher. And, and maybe think about your own labels that have been placed on you throughout your whole life that you have probably accepted and received as your truth because they've just been said to you over and over and over. And because that's what's been spoken over you, you start to walk that way and behave that way. Whether it be loser, failure, sinner, uh, loner, you're worthless, whatever it may be, that's what you've identified with because that what was that's what was 
spoken over you, so you're going to walk in it. But today's message is meant to empower you that you no longer have to live this way anymore, but you can come alive through the Holy Spirit inside of you, in you, and through you, and you can start seeing yourself in the light of how God sees you. And God says that you are his masterpiece. You're chosen. You're blessed. You're called. You're held. You're worthy. You're loved. You're righteous. You're a prophet, priest, king. You're a holy nation, a blessed people. Guys, if you want more about what God says you are and who God says you are, get into his word because you're not going to be disappointed and you need to start walking in the identity that God has for you because that is the absolute truth, not just your small smidgen of truth that actually is lie and deception. Walk in God's truth of who you are today. Romans 8.31, I love this. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these, about the things that we just mentioned, about your label, your true label, and who you are in God? What can we say about such wonderful things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Guys, he didn't even spare his own son, so there is now no one left to condemn us. There is no one left to label us except the one who created us, who says that we are called and favored and a masterpiece. He is the one who is only able to label us. That is amazing. And I love Romans 8.33 because this shows our righteous daddy standing up for us. Who dare accuses us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. And he's done this for us. Guys, he's done this for us. And if he's done this for us, there is nothing, nothing that can separate us from his great love. I want to read for you this amazing passage because I want you to start living this truth, okay? This is so vital that we understand God's love for us. And this is Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or suffering, whatever it is you're suffering, you can fill in the blank here. As it is written for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Guys, God loves you and he is for you. And I hope that you caught there that his great love has caused us to be more than conquerors. And if we're more than conquerors, we can be encouraged to do the good works that he intended for us to do. Not because we feel like we have to or because we should. We need to be propelled, not compelled. We need to be propelled to do the good works that he set out for us to do long ago, before we even created, as, Rome, or as Ephesians 2.20 tells us. So we do these works out of what we know to be true. God said it. We believe it, so we do it, and we trust that God is going to finish the work that he started in us. And in closing, we were at the marriage conference last month in February, and Jimmy Evans um, was there preaching, and he said something that really stuck, uh, stuck with me about this Christian life. And he just, it kind of ties Romans 7 and 8 together. He said that our flesh is really just our natural fallen nature without God. And there's this war between our flesh and our spirit, because while we were crucified with Christ, there's still this remnant of our flesh because we still live in this fallen world. So the flesh and the spirit, they're contrary to each other. And, and as Jimmy said, as we wake up every morning, our flesh wakes up with us. So we have to intentionally invite the Holy Spirit into our lives every single day because then we find freedom from sin's tentacles. Then we find who our true identity is in Jesus. Then we find that we get to live that freedom and fullness and abundant life that Jesus meant for us to have. And if you don't know this Jesus who bled and died for you, I just want to take a moment right now to let you invite him into your life. Just say, Jesus, I want to know you. I recognize you as Lord and Savior, and I receive by faith you as my Lord and my Savior. And Holy Spirit, come and fill me, baptize me, immerse me fully in your power, and empower me to live this new life 
and love and wholeness and peace and joy. Teach me to take on your personality traits and guide me in this new life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, I encourage you to keep digging into Romans. It is so deep. It is so powerful. It is so life-changing. Keep reading and asking the Holy Spirit to guide you. And I'm so excited. Please share with us what God is doing with you. Well, I love you. God bless you. Have a great week. And Pastor Tim will be back next time. See ya.